Yes, and with that, we're going to head over to our next presenter, Till, that will join us. Welcome, Till, to Funk Prog Suite. Hello. Hello, and welcome to us from Argentina. Thank you for and inviting your balcony. me. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's slightly uh, overexposed, but you can <laughs> see a bit of a city in the background. Yes. So, welcome. Uh, yes. Uh, today I will talk about configuration languages. Um, uh, I hope you can see my screen and I hope if I press this, you can see more text. Yes, that seems to work. Um, I found this great uh, quote from Dan Liu, which says, uh, configuration bugs, not code bugs, are the most common cause I've seen of really bad outages. When I looked at publicly available postmortems, searching for a global outage postmortem, returned about 50% outages caused by configuration changes. And I personally think, uh, I don't know if the methodology works, but I think the uh, conclusions here are very plausible, that large configuration files and their changes are very much what cause big issues, what cause downtime in servers, what cause uh, a lot of bugs in, in uh, other software um, because configuration files can be all encompassing right um, so in my personal experience uh, i worked with a uh, c++ code base for example and the one part that i really never wanted to touch was the build system because it was just huge amounts of configuration files uh, that i don't understand i don't want to touch that at all um, i also work with aws and aws cloud formation and AWS cloud formation is just huge amounts of configuration files. Like if you have a very basic simple setup, you're going to run into like 10,000 lines of code. Um, it's getting a little bit windy. Let me know if you can hear the wind. Um, of course, configuration files also can have bugs, but somehow we don't have debuggers for configuration files, or at least I have never seen them. And at the end of the day, configuration is just hard, right? Like programming is hard. Uh, you have, but you are basically only to naming stuff, right? It's already the hardest part of programming, and you just focus on the word. So configuration can be pretty hard, and it grows pretty hard. And I just want, uh, I mean, most people, when they work on a production, production code base, um, they will use tools to try to improve the stability and safety of the code they write, right? You might have a linter that tells you you're doing something weird. You might have a type system and type annotations to check what you're doing. So uh, you're doing sane stuff. You might have unit tests uh, that run in CI to check that every little part works correctly. And you probably have code review uh, for people to read the code once it's done. Like I think most deployed systems have like at least three of these four things. Uh, for configuration files, though, they're usually very long. Nobody really likes reviewing them. So you just kind of check them, and if it works, it's probably fine. Uh, code review for configuration files usually doesn't do much. You don't have unit tests or anything like it. Um, most of the time, you don't have any type annotations. It just crashes at runtime if, if, if the configuration file is bad. So fundamentally, I think we are at this kind of mismatch that there's so much focus put on proving the correctness of code, and so little on the correctness of configuration files, even though configuration file issues are what actually cost us money by getting our servers to crash, our programs to not work, etc. cetera. Um, so I want to just look at what configuration looks like. Um, very simply, you could, for example, just use JSON. Uh, a lot of projects do this. Of course, we can't have comments unless you use something like JSON 5 or JSON with comments. We don't have comments in here. We don't have many features. We just list them basically in a record. Uh, it's very simple, very easily readable, but we have very few features. And once configuration gets big, it's very annoying that you don't have comments uh, and other such features. But it works. It works. Then the next step is to use YAML. I, I can now put a comment up here. And I can put the same stuff in. And I have less quotes and less braces. It, it knows that this is a string, right? So I don't need to put quotes. Um, now, I think YAML is really horrible, uh, <laughs> to be honest, because this is still all right, right? But let's look at some more YAML features. Uh, first of all, 
depending on which YAML interpretation you, uh, uh, implementation you use, you can do stuff like this. Now I've just put this in, and if you call this from Python, uh, at least with some libraries, uh, this will be executed, <laughs> which I don't think it should be, right? I, I mean, I could put in here whatever I like, right? I can, uh, I, I can put in whatever code and it will be executed. That seems very bad. Um, uh, in fact, these kinds of issues have happened. Uh, there has been a huge vulnerability where basically, where, where absolutely every uh, user of Rails, Ruby on Rails, uh, had an exploit just because of YAML parsing in it. So like, no matter what you do as a Rails user, you just had this issue because Rails was using, is using YAML, because Ruby is using YAML as its configuration format. Uh, so that's already pretty bad. And there are lots of other possible security exploits as well with YAML. Um, uh, NoYAML.com also shows some great examples. For example, this one, uh, we write 4.30, right? And YAML is supposed to automatically know this is a string, right? So I don't have to put quotes in here. But uh, actually, I get this number when I put this in. Why? Because this colon means this is a time and not a string. And a time, of course, should be the seconds since the last midnight, right? And you can't really put quotes around it. You should put exclamation mark, exclamation mark, str. So if, in case you run into this bug, this is how you fix it. This is not great, right? Like I'm already wishing to go back to JSON where I can just put quotes around this. Uh, then, of course, there's the very famous Norway issue, uh, as you can maybe see. The syntax highlighting is slightly different for the NO than it is for the other values. So I'm just mapping country code to the name of the country, right? And you can expect like a huge configuration files with like 200 countries, which makes sense. Sometimes countries change. We don't want this hard coded in our code. So we just add like a little YAML file. Problem is this code will not work. Magnus, do you know why this code won't work? No. Amazing. Right. The answer is no, <laughs> because no is a Boolean. So this is a string. This is a string. This is a Boolean used as the key in this hash table. Yes, the word no written like this is a Boolean. So this is false. In fact, uh, this is like the uh, like the YAML 1.1 spec has this description of what a Boolean looks like. You could say why or why uppercase or yes or yes uppercase or yes in caps lock or n or n uh, and so on. All of these are valid ways to write booleans. So if any of these strings anywhere, they will not be interpreted as a string, they will be interpreted as a boolean. Also, by the way, I, I can just put this into this YAML file. Like this entire file that you're looking at is a valid YAML, including this, which is a multi line string by virtue of magic. Just it just works, right? Uh, <laughs> so that's bad. Um, then if you've ever used uh, AWS CloudFormation and their beautiful features and other AWS services as well, they give you uh, funny functions. So you can write exclamation mark or fn colon, and some of these work in some contexts, but not all. Uh, you can call a function. In this case, I'm using a substitution to substitute this with this. And then I have a reference in here that I put into the domain. So, right? So basically, I take the root domain name, which is a variable defined somewhere else. And of course, YAML doesn't have the concept of config variables, but AWS adds it anyways, and then I can add it here. So, just to be clear, in actuality, these things are strings and mappings and whatnot. And then AWS takes these strings and interprets them as kind of functions and evaluates them into a different kind of YAML concept. Because at the end, when you get a bigger and bigger configuration file, you will need stuff like this. You will need to be able to replace text and you have this clunky way. And then like this is from the other like, standard documentation is like best practice, for example, to have this kind of sub where you have a bunch of replaces in there. Um, going, I'm replacing this variable and I'm doing this from this <clears throat> like namespace almost uh, and this variable uh, and so on. Basically, all I have to say about this is that this is 
realistically what it looks like, except you don't just have one line of this. You have uh, thousands upon thousands of lines of this. And if you make a typo here, you don't get immediate feedback. You can try to install some linting libraries that make it slightly more workable. But realistically, you will have to send it up to AWS and wait for a long period of time to check if it interpreted correctly. And some of these issues are hard to resolve because you would have to redeploy. So sometimes if you make a typo here, this typo will stay indefinitely. Very fun. Don't want to work with that anymore. So there are some other options than dealing with this than I'm just accepting the horrible fate of uh, YAML. Uh, one common option is TOML. Uh, it's the configuration format used by Rust by default. Um, and it works very similar to YAML. Um, it's also kind of flat, and but it's more structured. But it is uh, better because you can write down things explicitly. You're not that much, you're not white space focused. And it doesn't have all these super weird bugs. So it's already an improvement. Um, uh, then some people decide to simply use a like real programming language, as in if they're already working on a Python project, you can just use Python as your language for configuration because it's evaluated like as a scripting language and you can just set these parameters there. And that works. Um, problem is just like with YAML, you are evaluating untrusted code. In some cases, that's just not what you want to do for security reasons. Uh, it can get slow because you can't really know what um, people will put into it if you put it like give it to other users. And it's relatively hard to port. Like if you have one system like this, you can't migrate to a different system. You're kind of locked in to how you're doing things uh, uh, yeah, forever, unless you want to do like a full rewrite. And uh, then there's also Q, which allows you to write basically like type annotations and validations for your existing configuration for like YAML or JSON or whatever. Uh, but of course that adds an extra layer of work, but uh, could be could be good. I'll, I think all of these options are valid depending on your use case. But I want to show you a different option today, which is DAL. DAL is a uh, more function configuration language. And if you look at it, it already starts looking very similar to the JSON one just different formatting, I guess, but we have a uh, key and value in our records are with braces. You have commas in between your values. Uh, you have quotes around your strings, so it doesn't magically assume what a string is. But I do have uh, comments, uh, which I think is already uh, like a huge improvement. Um, now, I previously made the point that there are typos in configuration files and they can come to harm you and nobody reads configuration files, right? And I've see, uh, shown this JSON, I've shown this YAML, and now I'm showing this DAL code. And unless you have seen this example before because I stole it from the DAL website, you probably didn't notice that there's a typo here, right? This directory is my name here, my name here, and then it's a typo down here, which means this is actually a bug, and there has been a bug in the JSON, and has been a bug in the YAML. Uh, and the core of the issue here is that we are repeating the same string three times. And uh, of course, we now have to manually make sure that it's actually the same string every time. So we have to review it. And uh, with a large configuration file, these strings can be in different places, and they can be used hundreds of times. And you always need to make sure they are the same. That is, of course, very annoying. So in DAL, instead, I can simply write let home uh, equals uh, slash home slash two uh, in this thing. And then, boom, I can just use the variable. Uh, so let home equals home. Or this thing, I, uh, oh, actually, I do want the training slash here. Uh, I want home class plus, and then I can remove this part here, right? I can, uh, plus plus just concatenates these strings, and in DAL, I just have this available. Like, I can, uh, I can just write code like this that looks like code that is readable. Uh, I think even if you're not familiar with DAL, you kind of understand what's happening here, right? 
I have this lab block where I define things before in, and then I define my actual it's up top before I do my configuration. I can define variables. And I, I think that's already like an improvement. Like I think at this point, we're already better than JSON, right? We have comments and we have these variables, which means we can reuse the same variable over and over again. Uh, and I think we can make it uh, even nicer because we can give this a, uh, what we can do is we can actually make a type. So we can do config, which is a type uh, equal to, uh, um, I can write a type definition. And I don't even have to think about this much because up top in line zero in my editor, it actually writes down the type that it had it has inferred from this part. So like even with, before I wrote any type definitions, my editor with Dahl can already see what type my, my code has that I've written. And then I can just write, uh, there's a home, which is of type text. Um, then there is a, uh, a private key, uh, which is also of type text. And then there is a public key, also of type text. Now that I have this type annotation, I can simply put it here. And if I didn't make any typos, I can just say, this is of type config. Everything still checks. I didn't get any error. That means it has now type checked this and I've validated my configuration. Boom, done. That's like, I didn't need to install any separate tools. I didn't need to do anything. I just write my type, uh, which is a first class value to say, this is a text, this is a text, this is a text. I don't know whether it's text instead of string. It's uh, the same convention as in Haskell, but they just call it a text, right? That makes sense, right? This thing is just text. Um, yeah, and that works. Uh, now, to prove that it works, I can actually go and call this beautiful command line tool called dal2json, which uh, takes this file, which is uh, 06.dal in my beautiful naming scheme, and I can print out the generated JSON. And it's the same JSON as before. There are also tools for dal2 uh, YAML, dal2 whatever, right? Um, which means, great, we have basically the same JSON, we just made it a bit longer. We now have a variable and we have type checks. Um, let's look Let's look at this example though. So here I have the same stuff. I have my variable of uh, let home and I have this stuff where I now have two homes basically. Doesn't really make much sense, but let's say we have uh, let home two. is equal to home uh, slash Magnus, right? Magnus also is a user in this repo. Uh, so I want to be able to pass down a home to. This is relatively realistic, right? And we can generate this uh, JSON, of course. Uh, this is JSON number nine. This. And we get an error because I made a typo somewhere, did I? Uh, expression doesn't make annotation. Yes, because this is, uh, yeah, I, I, I can. Ah, yeah, of course, I have to do home equals. Where's my equal sign? Yes, home to people. And I get this stuff. So I get error messages, by the way, that actually tell me what's going on. But let's not uh, talk about this. Uh, I have now JSON that has two. Uh, uh, that has two fields, right? I have Magnus and I have Till. They have both, both part of this configuration. And this point is getting pretty long, right? So in fact, instead of making it longer, we can think about that we have the same issue as before, that we have repetitive stuff. In this case, we're not repeating a string, but we are repeating the structure because the home is always built in the same way. And then we are concatenating them, uh, these strings in the same way and so on, right? And this is, I think, a relatively realistic example that you have, uh, that somebody makes a configuration system where you can configure every single value, but then you, it turns out in production and practice, you have a lot of repeating structures because you're kind of doing the same stuff. And the answer is we can define a function. 
we don't have to think about how, too much how it works. But what we do now is I define a function called user. Uh, and this function called user simply takes a text as a parameter, which is my username here, which is Till or Magnus. Uh, then I do the home, which is just home plus username and my trailing slash, select trailing slashes. And then I simply create the configuration, which is my record here, which takes a home. By the way, this is just a short syntax for doing home equals home, right? Don't have to write that down every time. Um, uh, fundamentally, the uh, with this stuff, we get home equals home, private key is set to home plus the private key string, a public key is also this. And then finally, now that I have config and user as my defined things, I can just do led uh, user till led user Magnus, done. So my list is now very short and let me prove that it still works. This is uh, 10.dal. We still get uh, an array and we get uh, two, two JSONs. Um, so yeah, we have two JSONs and now we have a function that takes care of these parts. Now, there's only one step to make this even better. We can extract the type and the function that we have defined by the way, it goes from text to a configuration. So we have proper type annotations and everything into a separate file. Because if we do that, we just get this. I'm importing a thing called user uh, from my file importer dial, which is just another dial file that I'm calling. Um, and then I just do the call my user function and I can have my type annotations as this is a list of user configs. Boom, done. At this point, we started out being like, we have JSON, but we can add comments and variables that so gets a bit longer. But now we are actually significantly shorter than the generated uh, JSON code. So if I do run off dal, this is already still our like all these lines, while here I just have to write, uh, I just have to write this code, right? I import it and then I use it. That's all there is to it. Uh, the code becomes super simple. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think just with this, we have variables, we have functions, we have types, we have imports. Our code becomes so much safer, right? Like this is already better. Uh, like if we think about this, we can refactor code, we can uh, do this nicely because there's one, one feature I also want to show you that it, I think is very nice. It's not necessary, but it's, uh, but it, it, it is very convenient to have, is I just refactored all this code and right I put it into a different type annotation, I put it somewhere else, so we can compare uh, 09.dal. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, we can go up here, we can have uh, 09.dal, which has all this long text, and we have 11.dal, which is all this short text, which I refactored. Now, refactoring is great and necessary to make improvements. And in programming languages, uh, we have tools to aid us with refactoring. So either you have the type system check that you're doing the same stuff still, but even better, you have unit tests, integration tests, and sometimes even end-to-end -end tests that tell you that after you did your change, the code behaves still roughly like it did before you did the changes, right? In theory, if you don't do any changes to your tests and you have like perfect test coverage, changing your code without changing your tests means if the tests still passed, you didn't change behavior of the application you're writing. And we don't have this concept for configuration files at all, usually, right? There's no way to go, uh, what, is the, what is the behavior of my configuration file? And Dahl came up with a pretty clever idea to actually uh, enable us to do these kinds of things. Because when we're calling uh, Dahl, there is, I think it's called hash of, um, uh, I have a hash function, which I, if I do that on file 09.dal, it prints me out some hash function. Uh, again, 09.dal is the one where we just manually write this down every time. Um, the interesting part is what if we do the hash of uh, eleven dot dial, which is the refactored one, the super short one, super nice one. We get the same hash. We don't get the same hash. I made a bug 
Yeah. I have a bug. We don't have the same hash. That's fun. Let's see if it's the same as 10. Yes, it's the same as 10. So did I make a difference? Magnus. That's fun. Uh... <laughs> Um, basically, what this hash does is it doesn't hash the file itself. It hashes the output of the file. So basically, what we're doing is we are doing this hash to make sure uh, the contents are the same. And they are not the same, which means I made a uh, bug somewhere, which I think is fun. Uh, <laughs> um, so this allows us to um, reconfigure things and yeah. make these kinds of changes. Yes. The, the viewer saw it like a trailing slash. A trailing slash? Yeah, somewhere. Oh, where is it in, in which file? In which it file? Could be nine then, as that's the diff, right? Uh yes. Oh did uh, home slash magnus doesn't have a trailing slash. Ha 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 ha. Perfect. Thank you, viewer. <laughs> yes. Very someone. good. Uh still doesn't work. <laughs> uh, very good catch, but or was it? But I think there's one more difference. This is home Magnus, and this is Magnus spelled the same way, lowercase. Um, okay. Uh, Still, still wrong, but <laughs> you get the idea. You get the idea. You can actually make sure of these things, which is great. I, I think it's actually amazing to show that I cannot find the typo right now live, which means, yes, if I was working on this and I was tired and I was working on like 100 of these lines, I also wouldn't see the typo. So it's amazing to have these hash functions. I think it, it proves the point rather well that I'm failing at this. But you get the idea. If the content is the same, then the hash is the same. If the content is different, the hash is always different. But the structure and the shape we can change. I can reorder things. I can extract things into variables, into functions. I can add type annotations. I can uh, use imports to put this into a different file. Everything uh, without breaking the hash, meaning I can safely refactor um, without having to worry about this. By yeah, the way, my have, file... We have, another, we have another review comment. If you compare home, it's like bin slash home and home. Oh, did I... Let home on that. Yeah, you have home only, and then you have bin slash home or slash bin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's, that's just um, my fault. That's just stupid. <laughs> now, now do we do it? That's great. That's, uh, it works. <laughs> Amazing. Same hash. To prove it, I will run, uh, run, run this one again. Yes, same hash. Uh, thank you, thank you, commenters. Now they're all awake. Now they're all actually listening. <laughs> uh, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect. Yes, hash function worked. We have, we have, we have proven it. Uh, I cannot write a uh, configuration code. Uh, this was obvious all along. Uh, good stuff. Um, uh yes then um th this is already like such an improvement because in the end we can refactor because i can put stuff into variables i can put stuff into uh, functions and put stuff in uh, to imports and i don't have to be scared while doing this because i have type annotations that would crash if i do something weird and i have hashes that tell me i didn't change anything and even if i change something i know it still puts out the right type and the right things and so on, right? Um, and I think it's also worth noting that without any type annotation, it still worked, right? Like if you have something like JSON, you can basically write down a JSON file uh, and have it be very simple and interpret it as DAL, and it will still kind of work. Uh, you can just start with this and then start adding comments and so on. You don't need to type everything out. Uh, like the types aren't in your way. There are a few edge cases where you actually need to care about the types. Like if you have lists of things, well, different types, it gets gnarly. But um, generally, the types are just inferred. You don't have to care about it. It's done with magic. I think it's very good. Um, so I think actually we have seen enough 
features of DAL already. Like there are there are some more cool features and fun features. Uh, like you can do kind of list comprehensions, uh, like in the previous talk, a little bit even in DAL. Like you have list map and you have filter and so on. Not not super flexible, but you do have some of those which should come in handy. And there are some other nice features. But I think we don't need more features, right? Like I I like. Uh, Part that I complained about YAML was too, having too many features, and I think DAL is still pretty minimal. You can read most configuration files with really with like the knowledge that you have now, right? You can look at it for like 20 minutes, and you understand the configuration, and you can read it. Um, but since I complained about YAML for having security issues, I think it's only fair that I look at the security question of DAL. Um, and they make it very nice because they have the safety guarantees page. This is the link you can see on screen. You can also find the link if you just go to the Dalang.org uh, landing page. And this will be in the YouTube description, of course. Um, that you can't, uh, that they list out the safety guarantees that they make and the safety considerations that you should make when using Dal. Um, which obviously there is no perfectly secure tool. It always depends on what your threat model is, what what could happen, how you're actually using it. So I think it's very good that they um, go out there proactively and uh, list the potential issues, list how much, uh, what is safe, what they can guarantee. And they put a lot of care into this, which I think is nice. And of course, we are at a functional meetup. I think it's worth pointing out, DAL is very pure, right? Like we have functions, but they don't, uh, ever have any side effects, they are pure. And then what we can do is we can import other files. And there's also an export feature actually to store dull stuff into a file. Uh, but you can't do that in a function. So you can't do that within a loop. You can't just indefinitely uh, uh, do some weird hacks or something or send stuff to a server somewhere with details. Uh, it is very secure simply because you're just doing pure, pure functions. And I think it's the perfect application because in this configuration file, you never would want to modify anything, right? Like you are just reading out data and putting it in the right structures. Never do you want to uh, to run a syscall or mutate anything anywhere. So it's perfect because it's perfect for the domain. Uh, it makes sense. Even if you don't like pure functional programming, clearly this is a use case where it makes sense. Um, they also talk about injections, because what I didn't show you is you can not only use a file link, you can use a URL to import DAL code. And with normal code, that is an absolute no-go. Just going like run code from this URL, whatever, is insane, right? But with DAL, because it's so limited, you can actually have this kind of power and flexibility in a secure way. Because you can have hashes, you can say, use this from this URL. By the way, it should have this hash. So you can always use this import uh, safely. Then you can run uh, dal freeze as a command on a file, and it adds those hashes automatically. You don't even have to manually check hashes. It, it just does it for you. And then with normalization, you can import stuff. So I can do stuff like, I want to use this dal file from this website, and then I just normalize everything, and I have my dal file locally. Don't don't depend on that website anymore. I have everything locally and, and safe, uh, which is very cool, right? Like if you want to make a package or like a library in DAL, let's say gives a bunch of types and functions to model a domain or model a configuration uh, file, you can just upload those to a website somewhere. You don't need to do anything. It's just a DAL file hosted on a website somewhere and you can directly import it, but it's also safe at the same time, which I think is uh, insane because it's super convenient, super nice. Uh, of course we have strong type checking uh, which is, uh, oh, I mean, is this a functional program meetup? I think most people will already know the benefits of strong type checking, um, especially with inferred types so that you don't have to write down the types every time. And then there's an interesting part. It isn't Turing complete. So like, uh, I think this is an interesting point because uh, like if you're like in university, you kind of learn that every programming language we use is always Turing complete. Turing complete just means we can kind of do everything a computer can do. Uh, and this one isn't. What uh, this specifically means is a Turing complete uh, system suffers from the halting problem. So whenever we have any kind of, say, a Python program, we cannot definitively say, will it halt or not? Or like, let me correct that. Of course, for some Python programs, you can tell that right away. But there will always be 
some Python programs where you cannot tell, will this run forever or will this stop immediately or um, so on. It's undecidable. And it's like absolutely impossible to do. And what DAL is, DAL is what uh, they call a total programming language. And total means that it does in fact complete. So we can always type check in an expression in a finite amount of time. So I have my function that has its type annotations and so on. Within a finite amount of time, we can check, does this work? Which is good because my editor shows the type annotations up top. Uh, if that would take forever, that would be pretty annoying. And this is not a given, by the way. Like for example, in more broad languages like C++, for example, um, the type checking can take an indefinite amount of time. Uh, in practice, the compilers just after some time time out and say, no, I give up type checking this, this is too bad. Um, but it can happen that it runs forever. And then the more interesting thing is, once type checking is complete, it will always succeed in a finite amount of time. And that is the exact wording you get from the uh, DAL uh, manual actually. I think this is a, this is a super interesting point because mm -hmm not only does the function complete at some point, like if you call a function, it will at some point complete, it will give you exactly what you asked for. And I think that's interesting if you think about it, because normal functions, like like if I have my uh, public uh, static and main, right? Uh, or whatever non-functional programmers do, uh, this is claiming you will get an integer back at some point. The question is, will I get an integer back? And the answer is no, because there are like at least two different ways this can fail. Uh, one is this can actually like, this can th throw an exception, right? Uh, exception. In which case I will never get my integer back. So that was a lie. Or uh, it can just go uh, on in a, in a while forever and never return anything. So there are two valid ways in which this code might never give me my integer. So it's saying int main is simply a lie. And what Dahl says and what total programming means is it never lies. When if it says I will get you an integer, it will get you an integer. Or at least theoretically, right? Like it is modeled uh, after this. Of course, bugs can still happen, right? But within the language domain, within how it is modeled, there is no feature to break out of this. There is no please crash everything feature like throw exception that just makes it uh, stop work. So if I have my fun uh, type annotations, it's actually true. That is what total programming kind of means. That is incompatible with your completeness. Uh, that's good for a bunch of reasons. First of all, there's uh, fewer possible exploits because there's fewer things you can do. Um, like even in sandbox languages like JavaScript, every now and then you have uh, an exploit that reaches stuff outside of the sandbox because you're doing some uh, interesting magic. And there's just fewer things you can do. Like I cannot do a recursion, for example, in DAL because a recursion might not hold. So there's one less feature I can use to exploit. Uh, great thing is it just doesn't freeze forever. At some point I will get my configuration file and it can load it, which is good, right? Uh, it doesn't just crash. Like it either gets me a type error or like an input error that I can't read the file or it, it works, which, which is also great, right? Like I have a good error message or it works. There's no weirdness. There shouldn't be, right? And it should, I mean, and then the idea is, right? It should also come complete fast enough, right? Reasonably fast. Because if it's unreasonable, then there is the possibility of exploits like a DDoS attack, right? Like imagine some users sent you a server instead of JSON, they sent you DAL. Um, and it has all these functions. And if it were to take forever, then that would be a potential like DDoS attack, right? They can just send you a bunch of these DAL files and your server is overloaded after like five of them and that would be very bad. Um, and this is still an issue, sadly. <laughs> um, so if I open the next file, I have just two things. I find a string, which is called A. I define a function, which I call D for no apparent reason, which takes a text and returns a text. 
this text is called T, and I'd simply concatenate T with itself, which is just fine, right? And I have D of X, and of course, if I uh, uh, run dal to JSON on, what's that, 15.dal, I simply get AA, right? This is completely fine. Now it's time for the chat to wake up again. How do we make this very slow? With just these parameters, you don't need any loops, you don't need uh, recursion, you need just these things that you see uh, in front of us. Can we make this very, very slow? We're we're waiting for the chat. We're waiting for the chat. Yeah, Come on, chat, wake up. Yeah, I think we have some lag. That's why we're waiting for them to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. I mean, I'm pr pretty far away. Yes. Let let us see. Nothing else so far. No suggestions yet. No Otherwise, suggestions yet. No. People Magnus, are. Magnus, do you have an idea? You you can also think. If we are still reading a config file, it could be big. One suggestion. It could be big. It could be big. But if it's very big, then you already expect this, right? It's kind of boring. Yeah. Like, oh, I read this 10 gigabyte dial files and it was kind of slow. Mm. That works, mm. but it's not it's not it's not fun, right? Because that also happens with JSON. If you read a True. 10 gigabyte JSON, it's also slow. Yeah, I think it's more crushing if we are very, very slow, or we can't evaluate it all while we're being a very short file. Yeah, exactly. Come to come to a situation where you either do it infinite, like you. We can't do anything infinite, so mm -hmm. it is not during complete. We are guaranteed there are no infinite loops. Mm -hmm. There's no infinity. It's uh, that is thankfully impossible. It's like ruled out. There's no while true. There's no infinite recursion. There's no recursion. But we can still make it big, and only with the elements here. Um, the elements. There are no more. <laughs> there are no. <laughs> we don't have any more suggestions. Still, show us. Okay, perfect. I I, I show you. I show you. And, yes. and we we go the stepwise, right? Yes. Because I double. I, I I double the string, right? I go from a to aa. Very simple doubling function. What happens? If I go like this, I save this file and I run this file again. I have doubled my string again, right? So far, it's, it's a very short string, right? It's just four A's, right? What's, what's the worst that could happen? But uh, now something should feel kind of scary because we are doubling, right? And I add one more D, right? One more D. Not not a big deal, right? I have I have three three doubling functions. I'm now at eight. Now first we had one a, then we had two a's, then we had four a's, then we have eight a's. We're doubling every time. This is exponential growth, right? That's the, we're already at exponential growth, and exponential growth is scary, right? Let me let me get more scary. Uh, now we have sixties uh, and nineties. Uh, let me add one more, and now I need to make these uh, parentheses work. And dum, 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 dum. Now they should be matching parentheses. How many A's do we get now? Uh, I already run it, but a chat, maybe somebody can scream it. I can actually just pipe this into uh, the beautiful word count program that, Unicode, uh, that Unix gave us. And we're running at 1,027. 1,027 is including the quotes and the new line. So without the quotes, it's 1,024. So two to the power of 10 in our string. Uh, two to the power of 10 is already kind of bad. This is one kilobyte. We have Our string has the size of one kilobyte. Allocating one kilobyte is very fast. This program runs pretty fast. I mean, I can uh, I can check how fast uh, this still runs, right? Time of this, 0 0.027 seconds. That's, that's fast, right? We don't have to worry about this. Now, what if I do this a few more times? Let me define a function that I would call k. k is of text to text. Uh, and it is equal to 
uh, 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 it is equal to taking a uh, T of type text, just like the other one. Um, but what I do in here, I simply take this part. So I do my doing D 10 times of uh, T of course, right? So I'm just doing uh, this function. T. So if I just do this again, K of uh, X, this should be the same thing, right? You just get one kilobyte again. Uh, and if I run this, then yes, I still have one kilobyte and it takes 0 0.2 seconds. Now you can ask yourself, what if I add one more K? <laughs> And if you do this calculation, you might see where our problem starts. So I will run this as well. The time is almost the same. It has barely increased because the counting uh, is fast and everything. But we just went from a kilobyte to a megabyte. Right? We're just adding one more K. We go from a kilobyte to a megabyte. If I add one more K, how much, how much memory do I have to allocate? How big is my string? Right? Because at this point, you are allocating one string that is one gigabyte of size. It's just three Ks, right? And one gigabyte of size is bad. So I've tried this out before, of course, this presentation. And I will not run this code because this already makes my computer very slow. You have to understand this runs, allocates billions of strings. It creates billions of strings, merges them all together. And at the end, we get one string that is... Uh, a gigabyte long, and then a lot of smaller strings also worth about a gigabyte or somewhat more. So we allocate like two gigabytes very quickly, and that's already not nice. What if I happen to add one more K, right? Uh, because then I have to have one terabyte of memory. <laughs> so if I add one more K, my computer is basically dead. Uh, uh, so that's already enough. I don't have enough memory to run this even. And if I had enough memory, the time it would take to allocate all these strings would take on basically indefinitely. And this is with four Ks, right? Uh, if I add just five, six, seven Ks or something similar, uh, I can make it worse. And with every kind of code that I have like this, where it grows exponentially, and in fact, if I use this trick of continuously adding uh, new functions, like, right, I could do a function which is like uh, big, which calls k 10 times, and then a function called really big, which calls uh, big 10 times, and so on. I have faster than exponential growth, um, in com as in the amount of memory allocated in comparison to my file size. And I, like, this is a very short file, right? uh, and I can make it allocate many, many gigabytes of or terabytes or indefinite amount of memory, basically, with just this. Which means our total programming does not actually mean it will successfully compute uh, in the real world, right? It's just modeled to calculate, but you're still constrained by the amount of memory you have. Just as somebody just might pull the plug out of your computer and it will not succeed, only within the models of the programming language it is guaranteed to succeed, not in the real world. Which makes it kind of sad. Uh, to be honest, I, I don't like this. Uh, you can make this as big as you want. You can make this as slow as you want. Again, I've tried the one that the, the next one, and it gets very slow. But you have to trust me on this one. I'm not going to do it during the presentation because then you probably can't hear me anymore. Um, and then, uh, yes, which means in practice. Um, we have to we have to still we can't just take untrusted code and run it indefinitely in a performance critical environment or where someone where might somebody might do a DDoS attack. Whenever we load DAL code, we need to set a some kind of timer. To be fair, that's uh, already a good idea, probably with other formats, right? Because other formats, if they get large, something might also take a long time, and you don't want everybody to have the chance to just upload a huge file. But yeah, uh, in those, you usually can contain the length of the file, which is easier. But in DAL, if you have untrusted code, you need a timeout. By the way, DAL libraries, so right now I'm just con uh, converting DAL to JSON. This works really well. But there are also a bunch of libraries for DAL for uh, plenty of programming languages where you can integrate it. And in those, 
usually you get a chance to set a timeout. So I, you can say, I want to load this DAL file within five seconds. And if you do that, then it works obviously much better uh, and you are much safer. You can also say limitations like, I don't actually want to be able to import other files, so no access to the disk, uh, these kinds of things, which make a lot of sense in, in certain contexts. Uh, so yeah, um, I, I think this is a little bit of a, uh, of a downer, but in conclusion, I think I really like DAL anyways. I think with these kinds of feature sets, obviously it's not for every context and every situation, but in certain contexts, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, um, I, I know some programmers never get into the situation and they never have to struggle with these uh, super huge configuration messes. But uh, I'm pretty sure at least some subset of the audience right now has experienced huge configuration files and they go like, well, yes, this is this is very good. I mean, I think it's like, I, I like it is, so obvious, like it kind of sells itself in the features. Now I have to say with a grain of salt, I haven't had the chance to use this in like a really big production environment yet. Like I've used very big YAML configurations, but I've never used like a very huge uh, DAO configuration. Uh, so maybe I'm missing something, but I think just with these very simple features, you don't even need most of them, just defining variables uh, and defining types when necessary uh it's already such a great thing by the way there is uh, a language server protocol uh, implementation available for dal as well so uh, several editors have great integration you might do things like go to definition on your variables and all that stuff there's auto formatting there is all these different kinds of tools for dal uh so yeah it, i think at the end of the day dal is great uh and i really want to recommend using dal uh if you want to learn more please go to dalang.org. Uh, most of the examples are, that I had in this presentation are just stolen from there. Um, actually from the landing page, to be honest, I really like those. Uh, there's a lot of documentation there. You can find links to libraries uh, for whatever languages. You can find uh, detailed documentation. There's the safety spec as well. And we'll put these links in the YouTube description, as Magnus likes to say. And uh, there's also the awesome DAL list on, on GitHub, which is very nice. It just shows you a bunch of other projects and tools uh, that you can use for DAL. And I really recommend uh, checking it out. I also want to say that while you can use these fancy libraries that have everything integrated, I would actually recommend if you have a big configuration, but just do it step by step, because you can use dial to JSON or dial to YAML or whatever to just uh, convert one file, and then you can basically, if you can convert one file, you can already start like doing a partial migration, adding like a little bit, like all new stuff is added in dial, then you can slowly add type annotations, slowly add functions, and you can take this huge configuration blob and turn it into um, uh, turn it into something more manageable. If you're creating a new project and you just have this tiny bit of configuration, uh, DAL might seem a little bit like overkill. No, I think your configuration will grow because it always does. So maybe it's worth checking out. But if it is tiny, I would say maybe please don't, just don't use YAML. Maybe just use JSON because then you can just create JSON from DAL and it's 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 very safe and clean. Yes. But if you have more questions about this, you can also uh, send me an email to till at specificadvice.com. You can also go to specificadvice.com, which is my like company website in case you want to hire me for any freelancing work or anything like this. Say you need somebody who to work on your configuration files. Uh, you can uh, contact me there, or you can obviously ask questions now um, because if you're now listening live. Uh, so Magnus, are there any questions yet? Thank you very much. As always, daring to live code. Also, I think you proved yes. the point with why, why you want the hash <laughs> in yes. the presentation uh, as such immediately. It showed. And yes, I've been, I, I never thought I about... I should have planned this. <laughs> yeah, I never thought about... I mean, the configuration language should be obvious because yeah. if you've worked for a while with software development, you will have seen configuration files and you would have made fault in them and you would spend at least a couple of hours debugging stuff until you realize you, you're missing a, uh, some trail slash or some hyphen something yep. somewhere which is not shown anywhere and you're just going to be extremely annoyed <laughs> yep, in absolutely. the end you're not going to touch them it's in the end it's like 
Someone else will touch these. Don't touch the configuration files. We did it once. It yes. was a huge mistake. <laughs> We're never yes, going to do exactly. it again. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Let us see. There is a question. Is there a benefit of testing your refactory by comparing hashes than saying diffing, diffing the JSON outputs? I mean, what would be the difference? Um, I think order of parameters can still be different in the generated JSON while not being different in the hash, right? Because a JSON in the records are not supposed to be order dependent. In theory, the order should always be the same. So I think if you like, have different null versions of refactor, the order of parameters might be different. Um, but yes, if you generate the same JSON, the same order, and do the same formatting of the JSON, then it should be the same hash. Mm. Uh, maybe that's actually how it's implemented. I don't know. I haven't checked. Right? But yes, you could, of course, do this. You can, of course, do this with your JSON as well if you, if you know what you do. Yeah. Correct. Cool. Um, yeah. A really, really nice example. Um, people that know Swedish will know that the month October is the only month that differs between English and Swedish in when, when done in abbreviation, which means system runs for nine months, works, 10 months doesn't work, no one knows why. <laughs> and that figure figures, well, oct, oct, wait, Ooh, now I found it, yes. Exactly like a little bit like you showed with the till and just switching INL. It's very easy, you don't see it, you're in a hurry. Boom, yes, you put exactly. it out somewhere in some environment, doesn't work, you don't understand why. Scratch your hair. You re revert your own git commit because you think it's the code. <laughs> well, it's not the code. Ah, no, it's <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love that example on the landing page, which is, by the way, great because uh, I copy pasted the code and in the original example, the name is Bill. Mm. So since I, my name is Till, I just need to change <laughs> one letter. <laughs> yes, very nice, very nice Till. And as you mentioned, we'll put every, all the links below the presentation and everything on the meetup page. Everyone can find the language itself. Yeah. Thank you very much, Till. I'm checking the the chat right now. There's no more questions. So thank you okay. very much Amazing. for a very nice presentation where you yeah. prove the point more or less. <laughs> <laughs> thank you as well yes. for having me. Yeah. Nice. Have a nice day. And to everyone else. Thank you for watching Funkbrook Sweden and thanks for bearing with us. So have a nice evening, day or wherever you are, night. Bye for now and see you in September.